Welcome again to the After Spell. This is Denise Paratrapat. How are you doing this week? I don't have a lot of updates, but I have been sick with a cold for the past like two weeks. And I'm sure you can tell by my voice. And no, it's not Corona. I am very proud to say that it's been a year and I still haven't gotten Corona. So, knock on wood. But I want to go straight into our guest this week because we have an incredible guest and we're so lucky that he is going to be speaking to us today and telling us all the insight of the industry, especially for theater. If you have ever acted on Broadway, auditioned for Broadway, I am sure you know our guest today. His name is Ken Davenport and he's a Tony Award winning Broadway producer and some of his credits include Once on this Island, he won a Tony Award for it, Getting the Band Back Together, The Play That Goes Wrong, Groundhog Day that got a Tony nomination, uh, Spring Awakening that also got a Tony nomination, It's Only a Play, Macbeth, starring Alan Cumming, Godspell, Kinky Boots, that also got a Tony Award and the National Tour. He has also many more credits and multiple of them are also off-Broadway productions. He has produced internationally in over 25 countries around the world. Not only that, Ken is not only a producer, he is also the founder of theatermakerstudio.com, which is a masterclass community that provides training for actors from like the best Broadway writers, directors, producers, and teachers. Not only that, but also Ken is the executive producer for North America for Andrew Lloyd Webber's Really Useful Group. Besides theater, he's also a producer for film and TV, and his work has been published in Vanity Fair, The New York Times, among others. Despite our coronavirus pandemic, he has some upcoming projects, and those include Broadway Vacation, Joy the Musical, My Life in Pink, and a revival of The Great White Hope. Harmony, a new musical written by Barry Manilow and Bruce Sussman, and a musical based on the life and songs of Neil Diamond. Other than that, Ken still finds time to write his own content. So he has his own blog and he has social media, which he uses a lot. So I would recommend anybody in the industry to follow him and read his blog because he gives incredible information there all about auditioning and the business side of the industry. So having said that, Let's welcome Ken Davenport to The Actor's Vow. Welcome to The Actor's Vow, Ken, and thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure uh, to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So the first question I always ask everybody that comes to the podcast is, what made you want to be an actor? And I know you studied acting before becoming a producer, so I wanted to hear your story. Well, really, I fell in love with the theater. and. Early on, acting, performing, that's just the first thing that opportunity that's made available to us when we explore the theater. It's the first thing we see, right? You go to the theater, you go see Cats or Annie or whatever it is when you were a kid, and you see Cats or you see Annie and you're like, I, I want to do that. Uh, and usually, I, I think deep down what kids are saying or people are saying is, I want to do that meaning the theater, they're just pointing at the thing that they see, which is performing. So that's always always the first entry point for, for most people into the theater. So that's that was me too. And, you know, my parents dragged me to an audition for the local theater when I was a kid that they were both involved in. Uh, and I my parents were divorced when I was five. And I don't think it was a coincidence that I got involved in the theater when I was five. I think the theater is the one place that they actually could both get along, uh, and which is actually my metaphor for the theater as a whole. It's the one place where, at a Broadway theater, 1,500 people, 2,000 people can come, and no matter how different they are, where they are from in the world, what gender, race, sexuality, doesn't religion, doesn't matter. If the show is a great show, then everyone is just unified under that message of the authors and the artists on the stage. Yeah, I think a lot of us can relate to that. I think a lot of actors started because we found a community that we didn't have outside of that. And that's what, you know, 
pulls us there and keeps us there. No coincidence that I was an only child. I was looking, I was looking for my family and I found them in the theater for sure. Absolutely. That, that was definitely my story too. Only child and that's where, you know, you made friends and you find everything. Uh, you made such a good point saying that that's the first thing you see. And I think anybody, you know, you want to become an actor and you know where to go. There's like a college degree, there's acting schools. But I think a lot of us ask, like, can ask ourselves, how do you become then a producer, right? What is the journey from going to acting school to becoming a Broadway producer? So it's actually similar to my acting path or what I think actually is the best acting path. So I went to the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Uh, in NYU, I went to the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. And I remember I had two teachers there. And one of them was like, you must learn the method Lee's method and that's it only Lee's method and nothing else or just consider yourself a failure and then the other teacher said learn a little bit of Strasbourg learn a little bit of Adler learn a little bit of Mamet learn every Meisner whatever it is and assemble your own method and for me that that's what I've done to become a producer so I I had to learn a little bit of every aspect of the theater so I was a performer for a while. Uh, and then as you know, I got into the other side of the business as a production assistant. Uh, I was a gopher, an intern on a big Broadway show. And that's where I started to learn a little bit about set design, a little bit about directing, a little bit about bookkeeping or accounting, which I you know, didn't love, but you learn it. Uh, a lawyer, all that stuff. So you learn a little piece of everything and then you put together your own style and what, what works for you. But every producer has different strengths. Every producer has different set of talents. There is no one, you must do this in order to be a producer. Some producers are great developmental producers working with authors and trying to get great product and then they hand it over to the business team. Others are great money raisers or marketers, but they leave the product development just to the authors. So it varies. Mm, so what do you think is your strength? What made it for you? I, I do feel that I am well versed in many of the different facets. Like I, I really tried to learn a bit of everything and it's because I came up through as an actor. Um, but I, I'm a writer as well. I'm a very curious person. So even when I was a P, I was just asking questions all the time to try to learn more and more about what everyone does. Uh, and because of that, I, I, you know, producers are really like the CEO of a company, right? Or the founder of a startup, I like to say. And when you're a founder of a company or the president of a company or whoever you want to call it, you are in charge of the entire team, which means you have to bring everyone together and make sure we achieve our goal, which is presenting the best show possible and making sure on Broadway it knocks some wood, pays back money to its investors. So I have to communicate with all these different types of people and get them all working together. And it helps when you can speak their language. So when a director says to me, I need more rehearsal because of X, Y, Z, I go, oh yeah, I, I understand that. Or a music director says to me, but I need three tenors, not, I, not two, because X, or a designer, the difference between a parkan and a Fresnel and a Verilite. Like, I learned all the different languages so I could really understand, earn the respect so that when I have to say no, you can only have two, or have you tried this, they go, oh, right, Ken understands a little bit of where uh, I'm coming from, so I'm going to work together uh, to, to achieve everyone's goal. And you know what you're talking about. I think in any role that you have in the arts, whether you're an actor or director, it's so important to understand everything. I've worked with directors that have not been actors and it's tough because they understand a part of it but they don't understand what an actor is going through and I think it's so important to have all those perspectives. Same with uh, producing of course. Mm -hmm, for sure. So you've had uh, a long career in producing and you just published a book uh, how to succeed in the arts or in anything so I'd like to know what inspired you to write that. Well, I, a lot of people ask me how I got started and what, not just how, like what, how I started in the path of Broadway, but what got me started in my path towards a more successful career. 
So everyone starts their career. Everyone starts their career as an actor, as a designer. And there's usually some moment that is a turning point that sets them on the path towards where they're going to end up. And look, I'm, I'm only maybe halfway uh, through my path or my journey. But, it, you know, the, the book is that. The book is what I learned from a lot of those people, including one very pivotal meeting I had with Hal Prince, who was a mentor of mine, that really gave me a lot of wisdom and set me on a path and principles on which to lay the foundation of my career. Uh, and everything I do really goes back to that one moment. So the book is about that principle, that guiding principle of what I believe it takes to succeed in this business and in any business, whether you are a producer, director, actor, whatever it is, I call us all theater makers. Uh, and no matter what kind of theater maker you are, this guiding principle is what what will lead you to success. Mm, so what is your definition of success? I wrote a musical and produced a musical a number of years ago um, called Getting the Band Back Together, which had a very br abbreviated life on Broadway. Um, but here's my general um, concept about creating a play or a musical or any piece of art. Uh, and it's based on what I learned from my English teacher in high school, which is everyone who's written a paper in high school knows like you have to have a thesis for your paper. And the paper is about proving the thesis, right? You have to come up, podcasts are the best way to market the theater in 2021. There's your thesis and then you prove it. I'm a big believer that if you're out there writing a show, you have to have a thesis for the show. And your job is to prove that thesis by the end of the show. So the thesis to getting the band back together is actually my defini definition of success, which is success is doing what you love with the people whom you love and who love you. That's it. That's it. And that's what that show was all about, was someone going through this realization that it didn't, money didn't matter, where you lived didn't matter. What really mattered was that you were doing what you love to do and with people that you love to do it with. So that's, that's what it's about. And actually, the past year, the pandemic has really reinforced that with me, especially the with the people you love. <laughs> because a lot of times in this industry, especially the higher and higher you go, you find yourself working or wanting to work with a certain type of person or a certain this or a star here or this that or they're represented by certain people and I think you know 2020 taught us that life is too short to deal with people who one you don't want to deal with or who are making it difficult to do what you love so I have doubled down on my on my strategy to just do what I love with the people who I love and who love me and if you don't love me respect me want to work with me and collaborate on something very exciting and just create something, then that's okay. I'll find someone else. I love that. You're definitely not the first person that comes to the podcast and says that about 2020. And I think we all have such a different definition of success. We all have our own definition. But as artists, I think it's very important to set that definition. I have it very clear. Otherwise, we have these expectations and goals and superficial definitions that we put in our heads that in the end might never come. And that's just a recipe for failure. Yeah, there's no question. Look, you, everyone thinks that, ooh, a Ferrari is gonna make me happy or the right beach house is gonna make you happy. It's not, nothing makes you happier than like endless laughter with friends, like nothing. Absolutely. Uh, so in your career, what are the main characteristics that you've noticed um, in artists, specifically in, act in actors, that they have that make them successful? Well, number one, it's a passion for doing what they do. Uh, and for actors especially, it's a, it's a willingness to show up and just like, okay, let's go, let's play, to get rid of fear, to not even think about it. Or I should say, you know, it's very hard to get rid of fear to just kind of acknowledge that it exists, especially in the audition room, and be like, yeah, this is gonna be crazy. This is the giant roller coaster I'm about to get on, but I love roller coasters, so let's go on a ride and see what happens, because 
what's the worst that's going to happen? What's the worst that's going to happen? We all chose the theater as opposed to brain surgery because we don't want to make life or death decisions, right? Our job is to, is to entertain people. If we can't have fun during the process of creating that entertainment, how do we expect people to be entertained? So really to ask yourself what's the worst that's going to happen and just get in there and like, all right, I'm game. Let's just go for it. Uh, just that, that kind of abandonment, that willingness to just do anything. Those are the most successful performers that I've, that I've seen. Yeah, I was talking the other day to a casting director and I asked her, uh, what is the thing that you wish actors didn't do in the audition room? And she didn't mention anything technical. The thing was uh, knowing that they can sense our energy when we go into the room. And I think it's exactly what you're saying. If you are taking yourself too seriously, producers, casting directors, they can sense that. And nobody wants to really work with that. We're here for the fun. Yeah, it's called a play. I mean, just say that word before you walk into an audition room. Play. I'm going in for a play. Go in and have a good time. Be yourself. I mean, actors are... What's funny is that actors are naturally charismatic, the life of the party, the class clown. They are the people that are more comfortable, but yet in an audition room, they freeze up. Like there's so much on the line. Just think that you're like at a coffee shop meeting some new people. You're at a party and just like, hey, this is me. This is who I am. If you want to hang out with me, great. If not, I'll find someone else who does. Absolutely. I think it's all in the mind. I think there's very high stakes for actors. You know, if you're in a party, you don't have a job in the line. And if you don't have that job, you're going to have to keep working as a waiter and something you hate. So we put that in our minds and it, it's tough. Well, number one, there's so much of that that I want to deconstruct right now. Number one, if you're doing something you hate, don't do it. I don't care if you're waiting tables and you're like, I hate this. Don't do it. There's a million and one survival jobs now. You can have a side hustle doing X, Y and Z. So no one should do, ever do anything that they hate. Uh, number two, you didn't have the job on the way in. So if you walk out without the job, your life is the same. It's not, it's not, you're not losing anything. You only have the potential to gain. So there's only real good that could come from it. You're not getting anything stripped away. So it's really just a total mindset thing for sure. The other people, the other way to get through that, honestly, is to just audition so often that you just become numb to it. You just become numb to it and make it a numbers game. I'm a big golfer, so that's what I do. And in order to be a better golfer, I have to hit thousands and thousands and thousands of golf balls. That's what I have to do. It's just repetition, repetition, repetition. Baseball players are the same way. Actors will get much less nervous. It's very similar, right? So, I, so golfers actually on the first tee, they, they get very jittery. Everyone's staring at them. They get hit a ball. It's very hard to hit the driver, like all this stuff, right? Uh, same thing for an actor. You got to do it so often that you just don't feel it anymore. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many classes and courses and actors keep taking them. And it's like, you can learn as much as you want about it. The technique of auditioning, everything you want, but experience, that's what's going to teach you the most. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have also a blog and you give lots of helpful, helpful advice for actors. You talk a lot about marketing and the business side of acting. And I think that's uh, something we should talk about because, you know, actors, we come from a very artistic background and we really struggle with the business side of acting. A lot of us go to college and study all the acting techniques and all the acting things. But then when it comes to networking, to auditioning and all these things, we have no idea. So what are the things that you think actors should learn? Look, it's important if you're an actor that you have to realize that you're a you're a product, you're a business, you are the CEO of a company, but you're also the product. You're responsible for getting that product out into the world. And there is no product on the planet that can survive or be successful without marketing, none. And marketing comes in all shapes and sizes. And yeah, going on an audition is marketing, but it can't just be that. Every single actor must have a website. Every single actor must have a video reel. Every single actor must have social media. You don't have to have every single, you don't have to have Snapchat, every single one, but you have to have some, some uh, web presence 
And look, uh, one of the reasons why people have to have web presence is to make sure when people like me are searching for you, we find what you want us to find, right? That we don't find the bad review you got in a horrible production of whatever that wasn't your fault or it was just some reviewer who was, I don't know, like just had it, had it out for you or the director or the theater or wasn't a good reviewer. We don't know that when we Google, we just see the bad review. If you have a strong web presence, that might not come up. If you don't have any web presence, that'll come up. And let me tell you from personal experience, just to scare some of your listeners into marketing themselves. So I actually don't enjoy the audition process very much. So I don't sit at the front of the table, I sit in the back because I'm actually not the best energy and I don't like to do that to actors. Sit in the back, I have my laptop open and the first thing I do when someone walks in the door is people think I'm answering email, I'm not. First thing I do when someone walks in the door is I Google them. I'd rather look at people's pictures and resumes on my screen rather than have it passed around. So if someone walks in, you were to walk in, I'd type da da da, boom, and I'd start reading. That's how I learn about a performer. And yeah, I will check social media accounts to see the strength of your reach. I'm not gonna cast anyone because they have a bigger social media uh, reach than someone else who is uh, more talented, right? Like the talented person, the person who fits my requirements will get the job. But if everything is equal, you don't think I'm going to give that person who has a million Instagram followers a second look versus someone who has a thousand? Unfortunate, but true. And again, let me just be very clear. I will always cast the person who is best for the role. But the other stuff does come into play and you need to make sure you're getting yourself out there. Uh, and they, again, just going back to the old fashioned type of marketing, networking and who you know and all those things is very important. And sometimes the phrase like, oh, it's all about who you know, it has a negative connotation. The people who say it in that way are the ones who aren't making the effort to get to know people. And that's the difference is that if you don't know anybody, when you come to this city, then it is your job to take an hour out of your day to get to know people, however you can whether that's following them on social media and commenting on their stuff, whether that's sending them letters, whether that's going to galas for charities that they support and are gonna be at, and when they go to the bar, you say, oh, isn't this a great charity? I love it. Like, it's that type of thing. And slowly but surely, not overnight, but slowly but surely, that will make a difference. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. I get this question many times. How do you even approach someone like a casting director, a producer, a director, um, for you, what is the best way someone would approach you? The best way is whatever feels natural for them, whatever feels organic to them, whether it's in person and they see me at an event or whether it's in an elevator or whether it's over social media or whether it's whatever feels right to them. Don't pass up the opportunity, say hello. Like the, the, the funniest thing is like, oh, I don't want to say hello. So this, uh, this happened to me, like someone I could tell was nervous and they were like, uh, and who am I? I'm like nobody, but I was a producer and this person was a playwright. So they were like, oh, he's a producer there. And there goes the, the actor audition thing you were talking about. Like, oh, I'm nervous because I need this job. I need this producer to say yes. Uh, and what he said was, I just want to tell you something. If you don't mind, I'm sorry to interrupt. Da, 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 da. And I was like not doing anything. I'm just a real fan of this show and that show and this show that you did mention three. And I was like, wow, thank you. And I'm a writer and you know, here's my card. And great. He just flattered me. That's the best. Who doesn't want to hear that they like their work? I, I mean, I don't care. Like people love to that. So that was great. I got his card, walked away and, but he didn't even have to be nervous in the beginning. It's just like, I love your stuff. I just want to tell you that. It's great. What a, what a natural, and it was true. Don't BS, don't lie. Just approach it in the way. So that's, that's what I advise people. But there are ways to get in front of people. Absolutely. I think we actors overthink it a lot. I see so many actors, you know, writing letters to casting directors and they have this template and it's all so formal. It's like, 
wait, wait, they're people. Like, what would you say to them if you were just at a party at a conversation? Like, there's still people like you. Yeah. There's nothing to be scared of. You have to be yourself. This is not a, you're not applying for the CEO of some giant publicly traded company. Be yourself in all your communication, whatever that is, written form, social media form, or personal approach. Uh, and the, the other thing I will say is that it, in, in addition to just being yourself, you have, to be, you have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to do these things that other people aren't doing. The good news for actors that like I wanted to market myself, most people aren't doing it. Just most actors aren't. So this is a huge competitive advantage for you if you take the step and say, I'm going to develop a marketing campaign for myself and get myself out there. And here's why. Like every single person listening to this podcast has seen a play, musical, movie, television show, whatever, and said, that person is not very good. I'm better than that person. How did they get that job? You know how? They, they marketed themselves somehow, somehow. And the, cool, the other reason why people need to do this kind of thing and say hello to someone or market themselves is that the amazing thing about what actors do is that it only takes one. It only takes one audition, one job, one connection to blow you up into superstardom. So why wouldn't you do that? Like, why wouldn't you take that... Hello, hello, I'm going to go in for this audition. You never know. I'm going to say hello to a big casting director because the next time they may remember me and get me an audition and that audition could be the one. Mm. You know, I think it's mainly for two reasons. I think there's some actors who have very big egos and they're like, well, if they don't come to me, I won't go to them. And I think there's a lot of actors who are also very shy. Uh, some, of, some actors are very extroverted and, you know, the soul of the party. But a lot of actors are very shy and they grow on stage, they grow in front of a camera, but as people, they have a very hard time networking. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. And for the people with the egos, what they, it's not that they won't work, but they've just decreased the odds of them working or becoming as successful as they think they are in their own mind. And that's the thing. There are no, there are no oh, the perfectly formatted cover letter. There, there are no guarantees to any of it. But you know what there is? Increasing the odds of success. And the more places you put yourself, the more you put yourself out there, while being true to you, right, and true to what your definition of success is, the more chance you have of getting what you want. So I think now we are in, like, really crazy, unprecedented times. And... It's a very good opportunity to do what you are saying. So I wanted to know what your opinion is, is the role of artists right now during the pandemic? Look, I think this is a very, a very important time for a lot of theater people because it gives you a chance to really, as a mentor of mine said to me early on, like this is a time to look at the plumbing of your business, right? We can't do anything with the outside, with our prime. We can't invite people into our storefront but we can look at what the machinery that makes the business function. So this is an incredible time for actors to be able to look at their marketing plan. Do I have my website? Do I have my demos? Do I have my reels? Do I have all that stuff? Do I have a marketing plan? Where are my social media accounts? How, what am I doing to get to know people? Like all those things. The other thing I will tell people is that the easiest and fastest way for performers to become successful is to develop and produce their own content. That's it. And this is what, you know, I'm the founder of a, a website called Theater Maker Studio, which is like a masterclass like community for theater makers, writers, directors, actors, everybody, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And this is what these people are about, making their own opportunities. It's why, like, listen, most of the actors I know would kill to be on a sitcom, right? They would kill for it. You know the fastest way to get on a sitcom? Become a stand-up comedian, write it yourself, get picked up by, like, that's who gets on, that's who gets sitcoms. Stand-up comedians, right? Like, over and over and over again for decades, 
So if that's like my primary goal is to have my own sitcom, then you should look at the stand-up route, which, by the way, is free. You write stuff on a uh, note card. You get it on an open mic. You walk down there. You try it. You get in front of people. And slowly but surely, hopefully, you develop an audience, etc. Creating your own content. A one-person play, a five-person play, demos. Like, look at what's happened with TikTok and the folks who created the Ratatouille musical or the Bridgerton musical. Both the creators of those... Daniel Merchloft, who really kicked off the viral viralness of Ratatouille, even though he didn't write the first melody, and uh, the young ladies behind Bridgerton, both were signed by two of the biggest agencies around. Because they developed their own content and they put that content out in the world. Which, by the way, is the same story for Pasek and Paul, wrote Dear Evan Hansen, La La Land. Same story for Jason Robert Brown putting up songs for New World in an 88's cabaret downtown. Like, this is how you do it. And we are so lucky nowadays to have the internet. Back in the days, this wasn't even possible. No, no. You, it was so much more expensive and logistically more challenging. Now, you, if you want to create content, you can do it with this thing right here. And millions and millions of people can see you. So that's my biggest piece of advice for people during this time and any time is spend some of your day creating your own content and putting that content out in the world. In other words, remember, you're the head of your own company. You have to be your own producer. Produce yourself. Absolutely. So I think there's been a lot of talk and a lot of confusion about why theaters are not reopening. There's like sport events happening outside and people are like well why don't they reopen social distance or theaters can do performances outside i wanted to hear what uh, your view on that is so broadway is a different animal than than a lot of other places around the country in that economically it's just very challenging to run a broadway theater socially distanced because of the number of tickets or sold it takes to pay everybody uh, and all the bills and advertise. We also depend heavily on tourism and there aren't many tourists here right now. So it would be very difficult for us to start the engine of Broadway without a large influx of audience. So we're just taking our time. The other reason, you know, Broadway specifically is that there have been false starts around the world. Sydney, Australia had a, let's do it, let's pull back. London has had a few. No one wants that to happen with Broadway because every time you, I, I, I say there's only so many times you can break someone's heart before they run away from you forever. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to break the hearts of our fans and say, we're back. Oh, no, wait, we're not. We're back. No, no. It, uh, because they'll give up and we don't want that. We want to wait. We want to follow the science. We want to do it the right way when we know we'll open back to big audiences and everyone feeling safe and comfortable and excited to be in the theater again. How do you see that when things open up again? How do you think the industry is going to be changing? I'm bullish that we will see a, sh a few shows open this summer. And then I'm, I believe we'll see the bulk of Broadway open in the fall. And there, I, I, th I think we're going to see this unbelievable rush of filling those theaters, those first few performances. And can you imagine Absolutely. what it's like to be like to be in that theater and see uh, like actors walk on stage for the first time? The theater in the history of the world, theater has never been down this long. The history of the world. So when you put all those theater makers on stage again, <laughs> those actors, those musicians, those like... I mean, it's going to be buckets of tears. We're going to have like a flood watch because there's going to be so many tears like going through Times Square. So I'm very much obviously looking forward to that. Then we'll see a little bit of a pullback, right? And then I think we're going to see a sharp um, recovery. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people, economists and people a heck of a lot smarter than me pointing to a post-pandemic economic boom Mm -hmm. uh, that there's a lot of cash on the sidelines because of the what Wall Street has done over the past year and also because people haven't been spending money. Right. And so unemployment may be uh, higher than it was. 
Um, but as someone said to me re recently, it's not 10% employment, it's 90% employed. That's a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and the demographic that goes to Broadway, they, they are doing okay. Uh, and also, when this thing is over, I don't know about you or all your listeners, but I'm going to effing party like it's never before when this thing Absolutely. is done. Like Everybody, I just feel, is going to be like, let's go. Like, yes. I'm going to every movie, nightclub. Uh, I'm going on three vacations. We were talking, I was talking with my wife this morning. Like, where are we going to go? Like, <laughs> whether we can afford it or yeah. not, we are swiping that credit card and getting the heck out of our apartment where we've all been cramped up. And yes, that means they're going to go to the theater. Absolutely. I think the mentality of society in general is going to change in that sense. Uh, I was hearing, though, that to open again, they would have to start with like more of a local audience because most of it is tourists now on Broadway or used to be. Uh, they were saying to lower prices. They were saying things would have to change logistically. Yeah, there, you're going to see some logistical changes. I'm, sh I'm sure you will. S you're not going to see some deep, like deep, deep discounting, like bargain basement prices to get people to come back because that isn't a long term strategy for Broadway. In the same way, I don't believe, I don't know this, but you didn't see some like deep, deep discounted for some of the sporting events that are being done, right? Like, so we're going to sell, we're going to sell less tickets. We know that. You're going to see some price incentives for sure. You're going to see masks, I'm sure, at the beginning. You're going to see hand sanitizer everywhere, maybe staggered entry times and all sorts of things. Part of the problem with Broadway, as opposed to theaters around the country, is remember our theaters are actually really cramped. So we, you know, waiting in line for a restroom in a pandemic is much different than waiting in line. Right? Yeah, it's very, very challenging. So, and in Tallahassee or Topeka or wherever around the country where the theaters are much, much bigger, there's more open air. It's not as much of a problem. It's a it's a more of a problem here, which is why we have to take our time. It's interesting. I follow follow tennis as a sport, and they're doing the Australia Open, and they're not filling the spaces. They're doing everything social distance, and for example, the prize of the winner has been reduced by many millions, and that's how they're making it happen. So I was wondering if the theater would do something like that. I don't listen. I I wrote a blog about why social distancing won't work. And it was one, economically, and two, experientially. Because it's just not as fun, right? Like, and see, tennis and sporting events, their economic model is based on television deals, right? And sponsorship deals. We rely solely on ticket sales. And what sells tickets is word of mouth. And word of mouth from a 25% full theater is not the same as a 100% full theater. So it doesn't make sense for us to rush back to a 25% model that's going to economically challenge us and have an audience leaving the theater saying like, yeah, that was okay. Like, no, we need them packed. We need them packed. We need everyone feeling safe, rushing to their friends going, I just want to see a Broadway show. It's the most magical experience I've had. You've got to go. I felt safe. I didn't get sick. It, there's all blah, 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 blah. And that's when we'll recover the way we all wanted to recover. Mm, and I think it's so true. The magic of theater is sharing it with others. It's not the same if you're seeing a play alone. Even it happens with movies. Like I personally enjoy more a movie if I'm watching it with my boyfriend or friends than if I'm watching it alone. Because art is meant to be shared. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So I have three short questions before we go. And my first question for you is, can you please give us your top three favorite Broadway shows? Les Mis, Phantom of the Opera. Oh, the third one is, I'm going to choose West Side Story, even though I'm going to choose it specifically because I think it's one of the best musicals ever written, because I don't think there's another musical that combines all three elements song, book, and dance so well. I don't know that I'd want to sit through West Side Story every single day now, but it has to be given the credit that, that it deserves because it's a brilliant piece of theater. The classics, okay. Um, since you didn't mention it, what do you think of Hamilton? Hamilton is the Les Mis West Side Story of our generation. It's the Oklahoma, it's the showboat, it's the new classic. And it will define many, 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 many decades. 
I'm a super fan. There's no question. I mean, how can you not be? Um, but uh, it's too early for me to call that my favorite. Too early. Hasn't been around enough. <laughs> Absolutely. My next question is, can you tell us two books you'd recommend to any artist? So for marketing, I would recommend a book called Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini, uh, which just studies how people, why people do the things they do. And it's a great way on developing relationships for those people who want, like it's all about who you know. Um, it's a great book about developing relationships. Um, and the other one, look, I'll, I'll say it only because I don't charge for it. Uh, you should read mine. You should read, if you go to my, if you go to my blog, theproducersperspective.com, you could download how to read, uh, how to succeed in the arts or in anything for free. So I'll save your listeners some bucks and just go there and get it um, because it's got a good lesson that, frankly, again, I'm, I'm repeating a lesson that was given to me by Hal Prince. Uh, so, and it's one that's timeless. And no matter what you do in the theater, it'll help you succeed. Absolutely. And we all do. We all repeat lessons others have taught us. And my last question is, tell us one thing that you personally cannot live without. Golf. Awesome. Well, tell the listeners before you go where they can find you and your blog, your website and everything you're doing. Uh, two places to find me if you want to read more is the theproducersperspective.com, which is my blog, or just Google me and I'll show up. And of course, the easiest thing to do is find me on Facebook, ba backslash Ken Davenport, or Instagram, Ken Davenport B-Way. I'm on all the socials. So go follow me there. It's a great way to, uh, I post a lot of tips for theater makers and artists and also very, very adorable videos of my two-year-old daughter. We're all here for this then. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Ken. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this and thanks for getting the word out about the theater and helping all those actors out there. Hello everyone, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. And I hope you took notes because Ken gave amazing advice during this whole conversation. I want to thank Ken again for joining us on The Actor's Vow and sharing his knowledge with us. And this will be all for this week. We have an incredible guest next week, something very different. It's going to be more focused on mindset more than just acting or just the business side of the industry. As always, please remember to subscribe on iTunes and leave a review if this podcast is helpful to you so others can find it too. And follow The Actor's Vow on social media, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, where you can see all the interviews with video, Twitter and TikTok. There's a lot of content going out on TikTok, so you don't want to miss on that. I hope you have an incredible rest of your week and I will see you next Wednesday.